Good morning. Give it a minute and I'll get going. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Good morning. Hope everybody had a great weekend. Molly, thank you for doing such a beautiful job this weekend. All right, uh, let's move forward here. So we're continuing on our uh, antiarrhythmic drug series. Today we're going, so we're talking about class one sodium channel blockers. And um, we're going to now go to uh, 1B today, which are, uh, I'll remind you, includes lidocaine, phenytoin, and maxillotine. Last week we did quinidine, procainamide, and disopyramide. So just uh, move ahead. Okay. So again, the class 1B agents are lidocaine, maxillotine, and phenytoin. They're all in the sodium channel blocking category. And these agents unlike the ones we discussed last week in class 1A, uh, shorten the duration of the action potential by preventing late sodium sustained current. And this is a little cartoon demonstrating the normal action potential and the theoretical impact of using a 1B agent on the action potential. And you see that it sort of brings it all in and shortens things up. So uh, unlike the 1As, there's no effect on the duration of the phase zero uh, portion of the um, of this and uh, and the action potential. And so it has no effect on the duration of the QRS. Um, it does, though, shorten the duration of the action potential in general, as you can see, and it can actually shorten the QT interval. And that, that fact is used clinically, as we'll describe in a short while. I think, personally, it would be my view that lidocaine remains the drug of choice for ventricular arrhythmias in children. Many of you, I'm sure, are very aware that in PALS, the recommendation is to use amiodarone when someone's having ventricular tachycardia as the first line. And that is largely true, except the one thing I've always worried about is that in pediatric cardiology, uh, channelopathies, and particularly long QT syndrome, is much more commonly a cause of VT than some other forms, uh, than, in, than in adults, rather. And so uh, giving an agent that can prolong the QT, such as amiodarone, could potentially be very dangerous. So uh, although I would always remind you to follow the PALS recommendations, in your mind, you should always be questioning when you're coming upon a cardiac arrest to be sure that you are as certain as you can be that the person does not have long QT syndrome. Then when in doubt, lidocaine's a great uh, alternative although not as effective perhaps uh, for some types of VT. It suppresses uh, automatic um, arrhythmias and suppresses early after depolarizations, both of which are uh, potentially uh, arrhythmogenic, obviously. Importantly, lidocaine is metabolized in the liver. It's eliminated in the liver. And so um, anyone with liver disorder, liver dysfunction, one needs to be careful with this agent. And the half-life is approximately one to four hours. Again, this uh, agent shortens the action potential in ventricular myocytes, and it may suppress it. In fact, it does suppress abnormal automaticity. And this is important because um, it can cause asystole in a patient who has a ventricular escape rhythm. So for example, if you have a patient who's a post-op who is in complete heart block, um, you don't have ventricular wires, you want to be very careful in using an agent like lidocaine because it can essentially... Uh, snuff out the uh, ventricular escape rhythm and you'll be you'll have asystole. So uh, I've not actually been in that circumstance, but it is theoretically a concern. Um, lidocaine also uh, can suppress after depolarizations, as we discussed uh, for all 1B agents. There are very few hemodynamic effects of lidocaine. It's one of the reasons it's a nice agent to use, rarely causes hypotension or 
things of that nation, nature. Uh, clinically, again, we're using it almost exclusively for the treatment of ventricular arrhythmias. But interestingly enough, um, it can actually terminate up to 15% of SVT. And so um, the fact that a person in an arrhythmia has their arrhythmia terminate with the administration of lidocaine does not necessarily mean that it is because it was a ventricular arrhythmia because a small but not zero percentage of SVT patients will respond to lidocaine. So uh, we would never use lidocaine as a treatment for SVT, um, but it can sometimes work in that regard. So you should be aware. Now, uh, side effects is very important. Um, most of the time when we're giving lidocaine to patients, they're intubated, they're non-communicative. But if you give lidocaine to an awake patient, uh, the neurological complications can be serious and are pretty much routine. And these can be things like seizures, paresthesias, visual disturbances, speech slurring, dizziness, or perioral numbness. And it can happen really, certainly the higher your dose, the more likely that can happen. Um, but almost everybody, if you ask them who's been on lidocaine, will tell you they feel strange on it, uh, you know, with the, the business about a perioral numbness, uh, paresthesias, uh, you can get seizures, I've seen that. So you have to be careful with it. Obviously, when you're treating a life-threatening ventricular arrhythmia, it's a balancing act, but um, you should keep, be, keep, in, keep aware of that for sure, uh, particularly in patients who are awake and um, not intubated or sedated. Um, in terms of drug interactions, phenobarbital will lower levels of lidocaine, um, presumably through activation of the P450 system in the liver, and propranolol will raise lidocaine levels. So one needs less lidocaine when you're on propranolol. Okay, come on. Now, mexilatine, which is the next of our 1B agents, uh, you should think of, uh, although it is works in a different manner to some degree and is not the same agent, generally speaking, we think of it as uh, oral lidocaine. It has a lot of the same effects uh, on the action potential, and it has a similar um, panoply of arrhythmias that it treats. Um, and so it's not a bad transition agent for someone who's on lidocaine. Um, it's well absorbed from the GI tract. And it also is metabolized in the liver. And the half-life in an older patient is about 8 to 16 hours. And for that reason, it's typically dosed Q8. But in small infants, it can be even faster. Can be uh, The half-life can be in the range of 4 to 6 hours. And so sometimes in small infants uh, who need to be on mexilatine, which would almost only be in the case of long QT syndrome type 3, uh, that agent probably needs to be dosed uh, every six hours. Just like uh, lidocaine, it has all the same electrical actions, uh, can shorten the action potential in the ventricular myocyte. It suppresses abnormal automaticity, and it can suppress uh, after depolarizations. Uh, clinically, um, it suppresses ventricular ectopy, um, but... You know, in the old days when they didn't have ablation or more potent agents, it was not uncommon to put somebody on an arrhythmic, an antiarrhythmic agent and then bring them to the cath lab and see if they were still adducible. And uh, mexilatine is not, it suppresses the ventricular ectopy fairly well, but it's only successful in uh, preventing inducible arrhythmias uh, about five to 10% of the time. So this is why it's one of my mentors, Dr. Ed Walsh uh, at Boston Children's Hospital, used to say that mexilatine is great at treating halters, not so much people. Um, and I think by that, what he meant was not that it was so bad of an agent, but really that um, it's probably never good as a sole agent for the treatment of most arrhythmias, except maybe in certain forms of 1QT type 3. Um, as I said, it's not typically used in isolation for the treatment of the arrhythmia is usually used as a combination with something else. Um, and as I'm writing here, used in conjunction with beta blockade in some long QT patients, particularly those who have sodium channelopathies like long QT type three. And even amongst long QT type three patients, although many will respond to mexilatine with an actual shortening in their QT interval, uh, there are some forms of long QT type 3 that do not respond to mexilatine or lidocaine. And so 
um, each patient needs to be tested, um, at least at the present era, until we have better ways to predict this. We typically just clinically test and see if the if there's an important uh, impact. Usually when somebody is sensitive to it, you can see as much as 100 or even 150 millisecond reduction in the QT interval um, in somebody who has a mexilotine sensitive form of long QT type 3. There are no hemodynamic effects of this agent, but just like lidocaine, it can cause a lot of CNS symptoms like tremor, blurred vision, ataxia. It also lowers the seizure threshold in infants. So uh, infants who are on mexilotine, for example, uh, if you have a tendency towards febrile seizures, uh, an infant on mexilotine can have a seizure at a much lower temperature and uh, has a much lower threshold to seize. And I've seen this in patients in the past, particularly in infants. Um, it can cause nausea, diarrhea, and vomiting. So uh, that's always a, a, a limiting factor. The levels of mexilotine, uh, just like lidocaine, are lowered by phen phenobarbital. Uh, phenytoin and rifampin also lower levels. And um, when giving uh, INH or chloramphenicol, which is not very commonly used anymore, but rarely is, it can raise levels. So these types of drug interactions are mostly important for your board examination, but uh, they might, might come up in clinical practice, particularly in the ICU, I think. Okay, and then just to be complete of in the 1B agents, there's uh, phenytoin. I think it would be fair to say that in the present century, it's extremely rare to use this agent uh, as an antiarrhythmic agent. It's obviously much more commonly used as an anti-epileptic agent. Um, interestingly enough, though, it was previously touted as being an excellent uh, agent for the treatment of ventricular arrhythmias in the 1970s and 80s by Dr. Paul Gillette. I don't know if any of you even remember his name or have heard his name, but he was a very, very prominent and um, really one of the founders of the field of pediatric electrophysiology. I think it might be fair to say he was the founder of the of interest in pediatric EP. And he practiced mostly in the 1970s and 80s up until the 1990s. And, you know, as is the case in the beginning of any field, oftentimes, you know, if somebody is interested in it, and no one else says, then what happens is whatever that person says is the truth tends to be the truth because no one else cares enough to really study it. And Dr. Gillette, who was very, very uh, important in the development of the field, he wrote a number of papers in which he espoused the use of phenytoin for the treatment of ventricular arrhythmias. And for a brief period, I think it was pretty uh, commonly used for that. But the truth is, uh, over time, the, the data to support that is extraordinarily weak. And I think in the present era, Virtually nobody would use phenytoin as an antiarrhythmic agent. I mean, I'm I'm sure since I do put these up on YouTube, there's probably going to be somebody who's watches this video and says um, that they have used it for that and had great success. Uh, I think in the present era, the only thing I can see that is fairly routinely in most uh, resources mentioned is that it is not bad for the treatment of ventricular arrhythmias induced by digoxin toxicity. So if you have VT from DIG. Um, in addition to all the common things that you will do to reduce your digoxin level, um, another possibility if you have VT is the possibility, possible administration of uh, phenytoin or dilantin. Okay. Uh, any questions about any of that? Okay. Um, so I think at this point, I'm going to do uh, two or three uh, simple clinical questions that are completely unrelated to this, other than that they are antiarrhythmia, they are arrhythmia questions. All righty. Uh, this is a telemetry review of a two-week-old in the ICU with a history of tachycardia. And my question to you is, uh, do you think you can uh, surmise the mechanism of the SVT, uh, this patient has SVT, uh, from this tracing? And I'm going to ask Vlad, what he thinks about this? Um, I think all I can surmise at this moment is that it, it looks like it's likely SVT because it seems to be a sudden on, sudden off, and it's a quite notable change from the patient's baseline. Um, but in terms of the mechanism, I, I don't know how. Well, we've talked about how you could have uh, the, the two most common mechanisms of SVT are either uh, well, what are they again, Vlad? We talked about this uh, two or three weeks ago. What are the two most common mechanisms for arrhythmias in general, clinical mechanisms? 
the re-entrant um, uh -huh. tech arrhythmia. A re-entrant, and I'm sorry, I missed the end of that. That's re-entrant is the most common. That's true. That's a good answer. I take that, 100% credit for that. But what's the other uh, mechanism? Like an automatic? Yeah, an automatic, automatic one. Exactly. So uh, with this, um, you mentioned that this seems to be a sudden onset and offset, which I absolutely agree with. And it's a very nice um, observation you've made. So would that be more consistent with an automatic or with a uh, re-entrant type of tachycardia? Re-entrant, I think. Mm hmm That's exactly right. Uh, very good. Uh, so automatic arrhythmias typically uh, slowly heat up and slow down. And reentrant arrhythmias, of course, suddenly start and stop uh, because reentry is a type of arrhythmia that does exactly that. And so this is a very nice demonstration of how looking at the heart rate trend can be very uh, helpful in elucidating the mechanism. Now, we see that the actual tachycardia rate was uh, you know, well above 250 beats per minute, close to 300 beats per minute. So that would be uh, also more consistent with a form of reentrant tachycardia in a baby than an automatic arrhythmia, such as ectopic atrial tachycardia, for example. Um, so yeah, so this, I think we could say from this with reasonable confidence that barring a uh, technical mistake or artifact here, this likely represents a reentrant arrhythmia. And Vlad, what are the two most common uh, reentrant tachycardias that can affect uh, babies or children in general, for that matter? Like okay. an AVN or T? Okay, that's one of them. Uh, and then what's the other one? Uh, I don't know if A flutter is common in babies. A flutter is common in babies, but um, that is not the most common. It's far down on the list. So you said AVNRT. That's a, a very typical one. What else is another cause that's even more common than AVNRT? AVRT? Yeah, AVRT, or what we'd also refer to as ORT, or orthodromic reentrant tachycardia. So it's thought that probably two-thirds to three-quarters of SVT in children is from pathways, and about a quarter to a third is from AV nodal reentry. Um, any, anybody who's been in the lab with me recently would think that all SVT is AVNRT, because I seem to have had about seven in a row of AVNRT, but uh, the truth is uh, ORT is the most common, or AVRT. Um, and um, and so, okay, so Vlad, you're on call. You uh, have seen this trend. The resident has brought you the electrocardiogram. You see clearly that the patient has had an episode of uh, some kind of reentrant tachycardia. So you're now going to uh, the mom. The mom has come in to the NICU. She's been in uh She's been home that night. She came in to see her baby and she wants to talk to the cardiologist. And she's saying to you, uh, Doc, what what is the uh, future of my child? You know, is this uh, going to be a chronic problem for my uh, little baby Bartholomew? Or um, is, uh, you know, what what's the natural history of this? Uh, how worried do I have to be? So what would you tell them, Vlad? Um. I think that it's mostly babies grow out of it, but they do have some like an overall relatively high risk of recurrence if babies present but with young the younger the kid is with presentation, they the higher likelihood of recurrences. Okay, so um let's talk. I it was a very vague question, so I apologize. Let's talk short term, <laughs> like the first six months, and then let's talk uh, long term, like lifelong. Okay, so in the next six months you have this. What's the chances the child will have tachycardia again? Mm, high. Yeah, it's high. There's a good chance. I mean, I don't, I, I'm not actually sure what that number is, but, and part of the reason I'm not sure of it is because we always treat this, um, or almost always treat this, but it's probably in the, I'll make a number up, 20% of the time uh, patients treated will still continue to have SVT. But, um, but what about long-term? Like, what's the chances that this child, let's say at age 12, is going to need an ablation, would you say? I feel like it's lower. 
it is lower. Don't we typically try to wean patients off uh, the ones that we start? If like we typically try to wean off at like, I don't know a year or two years. Yes, that's correct. We do, and in fact, recent literature suggests that we're being a little too conservative, and that maybe you could stop it as soon as six to nine months of age. But yes, usually by a year of age, most cardiologists will have discontinued antiarrhythmic therapy. Um, but okay, so you stop it, and the baby is not having SVT. What do you now tell the, um, and maybe you've done two or three Holters or Zios or Barty devices, and you've now confirmed that at least during those periods that you've monitored over, let's say, another year, now the child's two, you've now had, let's say, three more ambulatory EKG monitors showing no SVT, you're on no agents, you're not pre-excited. What are you going to tell the family is the likelihood that this uh, little Bartholomew is going to uh, have SVT in the future? Very low. I would say I wouldn't expect them to have it again. Okay, so it actually turns out that um, the risk is approximately one third. So roughly a third. So if you look at all infants who have SVT as a newborn, on average, about two thirds of them. So, so it turns out that in the past, uh, cardiologists, electrophysiologists have done studies with uh, transesophageal pacing to sort of see how inducible you are at a year of age. Um, and um, there used to be a fashion of even confirming that your antiarrhythmic therapy worked by doing transesophageal echoes. When I was a fellow, we used to do a lot of that. I never, it never seemed to make sense to me, but we did that. And then a lot of times when meds would be stopped at a year, electrophysiologists would do that. So there's actually evidence to tell us what the chances are of having tachycardia. And it turns out that approximately one out of three infants who have SVT as a newborn, if they are formally tested at a year of age, will have no evidence of a pathway at all. There is no inducibility at all. There is no pathway. Uh, they are cured. Uh, why that is, we don't know. Presumably, whatever pathway allowed them to have SVT has uh, just spontaneously stopped conducting. Um, the other thing is about a third, another third of the patients uh, will have dem demonstration of inducibility or, or a pathway through formal EP testing, but will actually never clinically have another episode of SVT. Um, but then a final third of patients will actually have tachycardia clinically again in their lifetimes and probably need more definitive therapy later in life. So it's sort of like two thirds either uh, will have no evidence of a pathway and not have SVT or have evidence of a pathway, but still never have SVT. So typically what you would tell a parent in, when you're meeting the first time is that there's about a two in three chance that the tachycardia is going to spontaneously resolve um, after uh, the first year of life and will never bother the child again. And that is the most potent rationale for not uh, considering invasive forms of therapy for SVT in infants. Yes, of course, uh, there's lots of technical reasons. We don't really prefer to do ablations in babies. And that's why most of you will only see maybe one in, or two in your whole career where we take a baby under a year of age and do an ablation because there's a lot of technical reasons why it's not a lot of fun to do those types of ablations and carries additional risk. Um, but the most important or compelling reason that we don't do ablations in small infants is because we're hoping that the natural history of SVT will be in the favor of the child. Now, there is some evidence, uh, I think Texas wrote a paper a couple, maybe a decade ago showing that if you had WPW as an infant, your chances of recurrence were a little higher, maybe as high as 50% that uh, beyond a year of age, you would have SVT again. Um, but still, fairly compelling reason to not recommend anything more than um, medical therapy for the treatment of SVT. So generally speaking, when we see this in anybody, we treat it. And the reason we treat, you know, sometimes people will say, well, you've only had one episode. Why would you treat it? Well, because if you had an episode, by definition, you have a mechanism for tachycardia. You have the architecture in your heart to have SVT. So we don't not treat this. The only situations where we don't treat it is if we have a premature infant. Uh, let's say there's a 23-week infant in the neonatal ICU who has SVT and has one episode. Um, because the child is going to be in the hospital for the next you know, 15 weeks, 
we would oftentimes not treat, or we would at least consider not treating on the theory that, well, the child's in an observed or a monitored setting, and maybe it will resolve on its own because, and we have the time and the safety to monitor this because the child's, you know, having continuous telemetry in the NICU. Um, and so, you know, if you have a patient who is, who you're confident there'll be excellent monitoring of the arrhythmia, um, then it's not unreasonable not to treat. But as a general rule, once somebody has had an episode, we treat it. Now, sometimes what happens is somebody has an episode on the first day of life, we treat it, and um, then they never, ever have an episode again. And, um, you know, families appropriately wonder how important it is to treat. And I've often had the same thought. So a lot of times in those circumstances, I will consider stopping the medication at six months. Um, and there is actually a growing body of literature, as I mentioned earlier, that that is probably reasonable. Uh, some families actually derive um, comfort out of knowing their child's on a, a medication. And how one stops these agents later in in the first year of life is really much more is really a, a matter of style. My personal bias is that at about six months of age, if a child is not having any tachycardia and has not for a long time, meaning a couple of months. I usually start allowing my patients to just outgrow their medication dose. So I'll usually increase the dose as they're growing up to about six months of age. And then at about six months of age, I'll start allowing them to outgrow it so that by nine to 12 months of age, they'll effectively uh, be weaned and maybe not even on what we would consider to be a therapeutic dose of the medication. So we can feel marginally more confident that stopping the agent is safe. Um, so, uh, that, that would be a general, a reasonably, a reasonable approach to the management of a SVT in a newborn or a young child. Uh, any questions about that or comments? All right. Uh, are you guys finding these drug reviews of benefit? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. So I think we'll stop here. I'm going to, uh, we'll go on to uh, 1C next week. And uh, see you next week. Same bat channel, same bat time. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. Thank, Thank you. Guys. Bye. Thanks. Be well. Bye-bye.